Oh, YouTube. Okay. So YouTube is going live now. Again, um, if you are on the YouTube channel, please switch over to the other channel as soon as you are as soon as you realize it. And um, that way I can get the other channel up going live just so that I can keep my personal family channel that my family all uses personal. Um, as things start to get a little bit bigger, I don't want that to become a public thing. And I'd rather do it now when there's only like 300 subscribers than try and do it later once we've got more subscribers on there. Ethnicities um, as in uh, types, uh, of appearance based on location is based completely on uh, adaption to that location. Like if uh, if you have um, the ethnic uh, inner fold or fold on the inner eye, uh, it comes from living in an Arctic region. Um, people who have a high meat diet ethnically will have larger livers, things like that. All of this comes from adaptations that they get from the environment that they're in. Um, but the only thing that really adapts is the um, parts of the body it takes to exist. Um, the problem with race theory is race theory tells us that ethnicity um, determines your mental capacity or your pain capacity. And these things just aren't true. Um, it also tells us that it, um, it determines a lot in life a space in life and whether or not you have the same level of uh, pinnacle on a scale that's not really there in life. Hello, Mia. Um, and so uh, that's the problem within race theory. Ethnicity happens though, and it's really based on um, the space that you're in and what your body physically adapts to that space. But those adaptations never include things like pain or mental capacity or what you should be doing in life, right? Like they never determine whether or not you can be creative or whether or not you're sports inclined because we find those people in every ethnicity, right? Every ethnicity has people who are very creative or very sports inclined or very things like that. Um, all of us come from one space though because we all descend from one people. Um, and it is in that descent from one people, but the admixture from every other group as we move across the globe that we can track our migration in. And also that we can see the beauty of us as early humans, because as early humans, we didn't have this division based on these thought processes. We didn't see each other like that. We just saw each other as, oh, you're another one of me. Cool. There's not a lot of us. Have fun, right? Um, so... Well, I would have to say that I don't think any group of people actually has um, the pinnacle of intelligence or creativity or nobody owns those things. And we really have to double down on saying those because if you decide that we're going to just transfer that pinnacle of supremacy somewhere else, what we're doing is we're creating more othering. We're creating more diversity. We're creating more problems. It's not creating diversity to acknowledge the problems and ask that the problems be acknowledged, but it is creating diversity if we say we're going to switch those problems from me to you, right? Um, just because that's the problem. The problem is making problems for people, right? Instead of being inclusive, instead of being the innately nurturing and communal people that we are, we've decided to other. And the big problem with that that affects all of us is that is done to keep us in check. That is done so that we're too busy fighting each other over stupid shit to see that we're being exploited and harmed, right? I'm going to go ahead, though, because um, it does look like we have a lot of people who are needing muted, which means that we have a lot of people being trolly. I'm going to go ahead and yeah, I'm going to go ahead and turn them off um, because comments in my chats can be extremely annoying for people. Uh, you being a shit ass <laughs> is not fun for anybody. So maybe, you know, close your mouth, open your ears, put down your typing fingers open your ears, um, because today we're going to talk about Neanderthal. And today we're going to talk about 
some of the issues with the Neanderthal and the early Neanderthal understanding. And we're going to talk about um, some of the uh, beautiful finds that we've got recently with the Neanderthals within food and medicine. Medicine is one of my passions with Neanderthal because medicine throughout paleoanthropology is really a passion for me to be able to trace medicine so far back. Um, having grown up in indigenous medicine is extremely important to me because it shows me that indigenous medicine goes back thousands and thousands and thousands of years, right? Indigenous medicine goes back um, to before we spread out, right? Um, and so it, to me, it's a really impactful thing. Um, but the first thing that I really want to go over is the picture behind me. Um, Wicked uh, and the, whoever else is in the YouTube, I apologize. Um, it's not going to be it was meant to be a uh, thumbnail, but it didn't show up as a thumbnail. I didn't want to go. I'm going to go ahead and show you guys what it looks like on the TikTok. No, I'm not. I'm going to knock everything down because that's the fun way to do things. Let me try this a little bit differently. Sorry. I have to kind of rig everything together because I'm as poor and broke as the rest of us. So this is the picture that we're talking about here. Now you'll recognize the one, and I know that it's not very clear, but you will recognize the one um, here, my right, your left, uh, is um, one that we've seen over uh, the history of our understanding of Neanderthals, right? Um, and the reason that this comparison here is important is really what we were just talking about. Um, and what is talked about a lot of times when people come into my lives and they see um, a picture of a darker skinned Neanderthal or a picture of a Homo erectus who's dark skinned and they call racism out. Um, and why I always try and address those things because they're correct. Um, me using them is not a racist thing and the current renditions are not based on a racist thought process in the most cases. But we have used this image of Neanderthal being a dark skinned brute in the past um, to impart racism, to double down on racism, to make Neanderthal um, more akin to people in Africa. And that, that akin to people in Africa means that people in Africa are somehow more primitive than Europeans. Uh, even though, again, Neanderthal is specifically a European body, um, uh, we still see that archaeology, paleoanthropology, and anthropology have used this in the past as a very racist effect, right? As a very double down of the racist thought process. And this is why, for me, it is extremely important to bring that knowledge in and to bring these things in. Um, I do use images of a variety of skin tone, um, depending on why. So the Homo erectus that we use, uh, we see that Homo erectus starts dark. Um, we do see that the allele or the genes for lighter skin color starts in Homo erectus, and we have traced that back to 900,000 years ago. Um, and that's a newer find, like within the last six months of how far back we can trace that gene. Um, so we do know that Homo erectus does get lighter, but we also know that Homo erectus starts dark and that that dark skin is that adaptation for the space that Homo erectus is in. So when I use pictures of Homo erectus that are dark pictures, I'm using them because I'm trying to show A, the humanity, the specific pictures that I use show the humanity, and B, um, we are looking at a species who is, yes, darker skin until closer to its demise. Remember that Homo erectus lives for 2 million years, okay? From 2 million years ago to 170,000 years ago is considered the time frame of Homo erectus. So after a million point one three. No, a million point one years of existence is when the light skin gene comes in. So the first million years of their existence, they are dark skinned. Um, and this gives us and this gives us the understanding and the knowledge that um, this is what we're looking at for Homo erectus. And these are the adaptations that are positive adaptations for us. They're the positive adaptations that carried on because of where we speciated at, where we became beings 
at, right? Where we became homo sapien at. These were necessary to our survival, right? And things that are necessary to the survival of homo sapiens, that are necessary to the survival of homo sapiens as a species whole, are genetic advantages. Things that are ne necessary to the survival as adaptations that are not necessary to the survival of the species whole are not evolutionary advantages, right? They have to be for the species whole for it to be an advantage for the species. Black is a species advantage. White is not. So you need to understand that the advancement for the species is absolutely dark skin. We don't get lighter naturally as we go on. We adapt to a space, and in some spaces, lighter helps, but only some spaces, and that is why it is not an evolutionary advantage for us. It was an evolutionary advantage for Neanderthal, but even then, Neanderthal does not get, this is probably as light as Neanderthal gets, and this is the undertone. So when Neanderthal looks like this starting out, this might pause me for just a second. I'm gonna switch up the background here. Um, I will also show the other screen, hold on. My skin, after years of sun damage um, and tanning, because that is allele within it, turns into this skin, okay? So when we are looking at Neanderthals, seeing that some are darker, right? Um, and we are seeing that even the lighter ones are not ex extremely like Nordic fair light. What we're seeing is that there's not just skin color involved, but there are alleles and um, melanin content in skin. But there's something within Neanderthals and early Homo sapiens that basically develops this patina or layer of dead cells and dead cells, <laughs> dead cells and oil across the surface of the skin that we see that they build up so they look older, much younger. And this is a natural kind of sunblock, right? This is a natural protection from the elements because that is what your skin is. Your epidermis, its primary function above all other functions, though it has many different functions, is protective. Um, Many of its functions are like uh, retaining heat and dissipating heat, which we've talked about before, but it's primary under all per is protective. So it builds up this layer of protection and through tanning and being out in the sun all the time, which the alleles for tanning are in Neanderthals and the alleles for tanning are in certain Homo sapiens. You see that the alleles for tanning fade out in people in heavy Nordic environments, right? Uh, by the time you've been in Scandinavia for 7,000 years, the tanning allele is kind of gone. <laughs> um, but you see that the um, alleles for tanning are present and you see that they have this ability to kind of create this sun barrier on their skin. And between the two of this, even our light skin Neanderthals might look darker in tone than you or I would think light skin means, right? Because often when we think of white, we're thinking Nordic. Often when we think of Caucasian, we're thinking Nordic, and that's not the definition of Caucasian. Nordic is a specific definition, okay? More Scandinavian, Northern European. These are specific definitions for white. And when we think of light, this is what we think of, but this has only existed for a couple of thousand years, okay? Um, or at least predominantly. I do want to state within all of that, that when you are talking about this skin tone or this skin tone, we need to understand within all of these groups and today within all the different ethnicities across the planet, you can see a recessive gene pop forward to white parents have a black child, to black parents have a white child. Um, or different recessive genes pulling forward in different areas that make changes that you or I might go, oh, that doesn't look right in that area. That's not what that ethnicity looks like, which, you know, again, ethnicity is only based on family genetics. Ethnicity is about family and about community, right? It's not based on certain people's only have these things, right? Like 
certain peoples may have these things as a predominant within them, but they have all the other genes there too, or at least the vast majority, depending on space. If you get to spaces like Iceland, um, where there is a narrowing of genetic diversity, then you're not going to get as many of the genetics, obviously, right? Because you have a narrowing of family line. But in place like the Kosam people and how we can tell that the Kosam people are the original population of Homo sapien, you're going to see all the genetics. Doesn't matter what it is, blue eyes, white skin, doesn't matter what it is. All of those genes are within them. The entire human genome is found within the Khoisan people, um, which means that you're going to see recessive genetics for light skin popping up. When we're looking at Neanderthals and we're talking about Neanderthals being lighter skin, we're looking at Neanderthals having a range of skin tones that are lighter, right? We're also understanding that in that range of skin tones, we do see darker skin. And we also understand now that within the range of skin tones that we see within Homo sapiens, earlier Homo sapiens, we do see that fluctuation. What we understand, though, is that certain things don't pass on very well. So this is where we get dominant recessive genes really coming from. If somebody is born with lighter skin in a heavy sun area, then they're not going to be able to have children a lot of the times like you're going to see that cancer is prevalent because that the higher melanin helps prevent uv uh, penetration of the skin right so you're going to see cancer high prevalence you're going to see overdosing of vitamin d you're going to see a lot of illness which means that they're unlikely to live to fertile fertile age and give birth and pass on their genetics so it's not that we don't have those genes is that those genes don't become dominant because when they pop from a recessive gene to a dominant gene, which takes two parents with a recessive gene, having a child that then takes that recessive gene and trumps their dominant genes and makes a new dominant gene. When we take the, those recessive genes and turn them into dominant in an environment that they're not good for, then you're not going to see them pass on as a dominant gene. Now, if I'm born with light skin because of the recessive gene within my parents in South Africa 300,000 years ago, and my brother and my sister are both born with dark skin um, because they had the recessive genetic, but it didn't pop as a dominant for them, I'm not going to pass on to my children. And so that is not going to become a dominant, but my brother and sister are going to pass it on as a recessive. So this is where we see recessive genes can pop and how we see recessive genes can play. All of this to say that you're going to see that there is going to be a wide variety of skin tone within all of these groups. And the other thing about this is from the earliest of Neanderthal that we know of from their Y DNA, we do not and have not found a Neanderthal Y DNA. The Y DNA that we have found in Neanderthals Pre us is Denisovian Y DNA. The Y DNA that we have found in Neanderthals post us is Sapien Y DNA. So, what this means and how Neanderthals DNA worked, the Y DNA is kind of a dissolving, broken uh, chromosome on the SRY chromosome. And all it codes for for us now is determining sex. That's the only thing it codes for. Um, and other things can determine sex. So it's possible like with us that that migration or that dissolving will turn into a different style of DNA or a different type of X that will code for, or the X that is there will start coding for the sex gene and then you have two Xs. This could be what happened with Neanderthals. Um, or it could be that in their um, Y gene is really a loss. The Y chromosome is really a loss of a full X chromosome anyway. So I don't really think that it would be something that they would have to replace with something else, right? Um, so it could be that they never developed it, but in Neanderthal, it's not there, but when they're breeding with other groups, it starts to come in, right? As a Y because they don't have a Y initially. Or it could have been that they had it and they lost it and another group took over. Or it could be, that the lack of, because they almost went extinct twice, though both of those are well after these portions of time, it could be that in those almost extinction events, they um, were able to uh, 
what's the words I'm looking for? They were able to only remain a species by bringing in that Y DNA. So there's many reasons that it could happen. But what this is saying is that we don't see Neanderthal as ever really being a species alone. From its very beginning, we see that Neanderthal is really mixing with Denisovian and Sapien as soon as Sapien's coming out of the woodwork, right? Denisovian comes out of the woodwork earlier than we do and mixes with them earlier than we do. But as soon as we come out of Africa, the southern portion of Africa, we start mixing with Neanderthal ASAP, which means that all of these groups of people are not only looking diverse in their skin tone, but their morphology, because we're looking at bands, which could include up to eight or nine different species within these bands of people as we look at this. And the reasons that we can understand this is because we're seeing this mixture within these groups. And this mixture comes from living side by side for extended period of time, because being two different species, most of our offspring are infertile, which means we have to have several hundred to get to a fertile one to give us the DNA we have now. Now, all of this is important in our understanding. Is this gonna be the right one? Yes. Because early archeology span and anthropology doubled down on racism with Neanderthal. Early archeology span doubled down on racism with the idea that Neanderthal was a primitive brute. On the, that side behind me is the old rendition. This has been seen for decades. Um, this is La Chapelle St. Owl one. Um, and this is the old rendition of him and the new rendition of him. And as you can see in these differenting renditions, the old rendition looks at him as a dark skinned brute and tries to equate dark skin with this primitiveness, right? This is where we see a lot of racism with Neanderthals, within paleoanthropology, within archeology span and within anthropology. And La Chapelle was found in 1908. Um, so this is in the 1900s that we're seeing this, right? So we need to understand this isn't a distant thing. This is a new thing. And this is why it's often brought up when people see darker skin Neanderthals or darker skin hominins behind me. Because many people um, who are part of marginalized groups who this primitiveness has been applied to know that this has happened. But many people who aren't don't, right? Um, and so. Uh, that's what they mean when they call out the racism in it. Um, and there is racism in images like the one up here. Uh, at this point, though, the images that we have of uh, Homo erectus is not based on racism. It is based on what we believe they were and based on the fact that we believe that to be the advantage, right? Based on the fact that we know that that is the positive. And one of the reasons that I use them is to display the fact that that is the positive. That is the species advantage dark skin is. We all start out that way and we all start out that way for a reason, right? Because as we do this anti-race theory work, as my field works to debunk the theories that they themselves created, it's important that everybody within that field works to debunk the theories that were created, right? works to change that so that society will still based very much in racism and a racist structure can understand that race is not a valid way to categorize and therefore we can start to dissolve that racist structure that's built around it right um and that's why for me this image specifically is important because this image shows the change in our understanding and the change in our racist attempts, right? The change in the racism within the field and the change in trying to create a better space and understanding within the field of paleoanthropology, archaeology, and anthropology. Um, and this really comes from the fact that we have a lot of different voices within the field now. Many of the voices within the field come from indigenous communities, black communities, and Asian communities, and other communities across the globe, right? And because we're seeing that, what we're seeing is this greater understanding. This often to me is really pointed out 
in a conversation I had with a person who taught lab and who was just, I have issues with this person, um, older white dude, but like my age older, not like old enough to really have this shit steeped within them. And one of the things that they wanted us to do was evaluate an article and evaluate the tools within the article. He expected me to use the computer module tools, but what I evaluated was the fact that they talked about speaking to the elders in the area, but they didn't talk about speaking on, they didn't talk about what the elders said the usage of the area was, right? They were trying to determine how long an area had been used and um, what the usage was. Is this a hunting ground? Is this a, a village, right? Like they're trying to determine this. And instead of talking to the elders and getting that information, they decided that they were going to determine archaeologically because they decided that this area, this area was not um, the same people, right? Because they decided that this is a prior culture without understanding how Turtle Island indigenous people's prior culture is their culture, right? Like how without understanding that that's grandmother, it doesn't matter if that's grandmother 40 generations removed, that's still grandmother, right? That's still culture, right? That's still connection. And um, and so they were trying to do it from a white perspective instead of doing it from an elder's perspective. They had access to elders, but they weren't asking the important questions in an important way. And um, I pointed this out and he went off and he told me that um, first he was like, that's not what the point was. You were supposed to evaluate their the mechanical things. And I was like, okay, whatever. Um, but he went off and told me that um, indigenous people don't like to talk. And I was like, well, no, indigenous people don't like to be harmed by volunteering themselves for your inspection, right? Indigenous people don't like to give information that you're going to then turn around and use against them. But if you go to indigenous people and talk about how you're trying to, or what do they need from this, A, eh? and if you go to indigenous people and you go, this is what I'm trying to figure out, what would you like me to know about this? And if you go in a space of honor to the people instead of honor to yourself, right? Instead of accolade seeking, right? So I'm trying to explain this to this dude and all he can get out of this is people don't want to talk. And it's not that people don't want to talk. People would love to tell you their stories if you would shut up and listen for once, right? People, yeah, <laughs> now nah, buddy, people don't want to talk to you. And that's very real. It, it's not that indigenous people don't want you to understand their stories. It's that they want you to actually understand their stories. And as long as you're entering in a white voice, and trying to put your voice above their voice, indigenous people don't want to fucking talk to you, right? And so we do see that these issues are absolutely still prevalent within um, archaeology and anthropology today, and that it is still prevalent within certain sectors of archaeology and anthropology, where you see that other sectors of archaeology and anthropology, usually the ones that are very um, non cishet white, um, have brought forth a lot of these knowledges and issues and are really working to put this stuff out. And so I found this image today as a comparison, as a side by side, and I didn't realize that these were the same, you know, the same graves rendition, right? Um, before, and I'd seen both of them. I mean, obviously everybody's seen that one. Um, but, uh, I've seen both of them before and I didn't realize they're the same. And I really love the impact of this. And I thought that I should really talk on that today. We haven't talked on that within Neanderthals a lot. And we have talked on it a bit within Homo erectus. Um, but this is a very impactful part of what this field is doing, um, what the marginalized voices in this field are trying to do, right? What the peoples that we typically don't find within this field are trying to do. They're trying to change our perception. They're trying to make us understand that um, primitive is not the primitive we think it is, <laughs> A, and B, that darker skin tone does not equal primitive, and C, race doesn't exist. Culture exists. 100%. Ethnicity exists. 100%. These things are based on your family lines. These things are based on the spaces that you and your ancestors have lived. These things are based on your connection to community and land, right? Space. Um, but they are not anything to do with intelligence. They're not anything to do with what you should or shouldn't be doing in this world and what your capabilities are, right? 
with all of that, though, our focus for the next week is going to be food and medicine and Neanderthals. Um, on the inwidaorg.com site is a list of a bunch of different uh, websites that I have pulled up some images from for today. Um, for me, when we're looking at Neanderthals, this is a huge part of the understanding of Neanderthals as a species, understanding of our understanding of the world as well, right? Because we're not finding that Neanderthals had no skills and got skills when they mixed with us. We're finding that Neanderthals had an equal amount of skill. And when they mixed with our equal amount of skill, those equal amount of skills together, thank you, that's cool. Those equal amount of skills together created new skills, right? That equal amount of, and again, every time you see two cultures mixing, you see new development, right? Because your box and my box meet. And once these boxes meet, they shatter and a new box is formed, right? New understanding is formed. So we see that within Neanderthals and Homo sapiens, that those mixtures, that those meetings, that those living for 100,000 years in the Levant together really gives an advance to both tool assemblages and really gives advance to both uh, medicine assemblages and really gives an advance to finally, you know, us burying and them burying their dead and um, art, right? One thing that I love about the newer rendition over here is the fact that you're seeing the feathers, you're seeing the eagle talons, you're seeing um, some of the things that we were talking about in the last week with the jewelry. These are definitely things that we're seeing as identity expression, right? Expression of identity of either group or uh, family or maybe even individual, though less likely of an individual level and more likely of a group level. Um, but when we're looking at the different, um, let me see if I can get my pictures up here. The different things within Neanderthals, um, medicine being such an important part of this, I have, oh, it's not going to do it like that. Okay. Oh, well, okay. I want to start. Not with La Chapelle, though we will talk about La Chapelle, which is the image behind me, but with Shanadar 1. Shanadar 1 is a very impactful find because uh, it was impactful in its time. We found a whole bunch of people together with some very impactful information. Uh, and then uh, Gene M. All wrote a series of books that uh, based its first on Shanadar 1. And this is where we get Clan of the Cave Bear from and the Earth's Children series. And Gene M. All was working with the information they had at the time and working very well with the information they had at the time. Um, Gene, a clan of the cave bear is exactly what we understood of Neanderthals at the time. There have been some significant changes. We do understand that Neanderthals absolutely have uh, sound, like they can talk in the same vocal patterns that we do. We discuss this in our first on this series. They um, have the inner ear that's the same as ours, so they can hear the same vibration levels and the same syllabic levels as us. So um, it is very likely that their speech patterns sounded somewhat like ours. We were also living together for long periods of time. I mean, we're going to, there are other ways to communicate, but if we're both very verbal species, we're probably going to find verbal ways to communicate with each other. And we are both very verbal species. Um, so we're going to start with Shanadar 1. And the first thing that I'm going to start with today, and we're going to try and do it this way so that we can... Let me make sure that this camera is going a little bit straight ahead so that everybody can see them at the same time. Again, all of these images I have links to on my website. This one, not so much. This one is a Wikipedia image just because it's the front of the cave. Not taking knowledge from new Wikipedia, just the image. But this is the cave entrance into Shanadar 1, or into Shanadar Cave. This is a gorgeous plateau of grass leading up into this kind of semi-arch like this, right? That kind of is covered a little bit as it's going in by the uh, the hill itself in front of it. The hill itself in front of it um, comes up like this and that side, right? You see where it was coming up. And as it's coming up, let me see if I can get this up closer. I can, maybe. Um, as it's coming up, it actually, let me see if 
I can get that entrance up and close. So as we're looking at this hill here, as it's coming up here, this actually drops behind it. So there's actually this almost half block across the entryway of the cave for Shanadar Cave. So with this kind of half block across the entryway for Shanadar Cave right here, what we're seeing is that there's offer of protection already from this cave. It is a prime cave spot, right? Shanadar um, had eight Neanderthals, nine Neanderthals, but Shanadar is currently being excavated again. And our newest information on food that everybody saw, the flatbread, comes from Shanadar. So we are currently getting a wealth of information from Shanadar. When they started the re-excavation in the middle of the pandemic, um, they were pointing out then that like one of the skeletons that they had found prior, I think Shanadar 9, I think they found eight whole and then they found like a partial and one of the partials, they found the rest of it when they reopened the excavation. So this is Shanadar 1. This is the one that we all know as Kreb, okay? Shanadar 1 is a, um, this is his skull put together. They put it together with two different things. Um, this is an older put together. This is from Smithsonian. And again, the websites are all linked in the this week's tab in my page. Um, they used to use this black. Now they use something that's more the color of the skull. But I wanted this image because it's giving you the ability to see which pieces of this skull we're actually getting. Let me see if I can do this without looking at it. Ha ha ha. So when we talk about Shanadar 1, one of the things that is often talked about is the fact that Shanadar 1 actually was a cripple, right? Actually was uh, completely crippled and uh, was also deaf and blind in one eye. Uh, their entire left side, right side? It might be right side. It might be left. I'd have to go and look again. <laughs> I don't remember looking and seeing which one it was. I think it's the left side of their body is actually like they suffered brain damage as a child. What happened was they had a crushing blow to their head as a child. And this crushing blow to their head as a child, um, we're not sure how it happened. It could be from, uh, you know, a cave collapse. It could be from, uh, could be violence, right? Uh, it could be from uh, falling and, and, and landing on a rock, right? There's several different ways that this can happen. This is why we don't call it like a definitive evidence of violence because we don't know how it happened. But having this crushing blow to their head as a child means that their um, entire, and I believe it's the left side, I should probably double check, but I don't want to try and read through the articles right now because that becomes hard. Um, their entire side was shriveled, right? Um, they lost the use of their arm. Their forearm was actually amputated. Um, and uh, they lost the use of the right side of their body. Let me double check something because now I can't remember if it is them or La Chapelle. La Chapelle and, um, and uh, La Chapelle one and Shanadar one have very similar injuries. And sometimes I get them backwards, unfortunately. Um, so, and I was looking at them this morning, but just because I was looking at them this morning, stuff in my mind, and I want to make sure I'm giving you the correct information. Um, but we see that their entire body was shriveled. They were deaf completely. Um, and uh, they, the forearm was missing. Let me see if this one says it's him. I know that the forearm is missing in both of them, but one of them, yes. Okay. He sustained a serious blow to the side of the face, fractures, and the eventual amputation of the right arm. It is the right side, right arm at the elbow, as well as systemic degenerative condition. Now, what this shows us that's important is medicine, right? What this shows us that's important is that this person lived through a debilitating injury as a child that would have required, there it is. This is a recreation of the skull with the putty being skull colored so that the uh, skull looks like um, a skull, right? Um, so you can see where it's almost like falling down, right? 
you can see that you're not seeing it so much in the front, right? But you can see it. Hold on, let me think for a second. Yes, you can see it here. You can see it here in this, this crumpling here, right? I wanted to make sure my sides were right. Um, and because look, you can see where this zyg zygomatic arch sticks out wide here. Do you see where it kind of is? This is your zygomatic arch, your cheekbone, right? Um, in Neanderthals, it comes out really wide because the muscular attachment from your jaw goes under this cheekbone, even in us. And so with um, Neanderthals, because their muscular attachment here is larger, their zygomatic arch here is it sticks out a little bit further. And you can see on this side where that zygomatic arch sticks out more naturally. Well, on this side, that zygomatic arch seems to be crumpled in. You can also see where this side of the face seems to look in, like be dented in a little bit more than this side of the face, right? And so these injuries really change the way that this person lived. These injuries are thought to have happened when they were a child. And there is debate on their age, uh, 35 to 45, 40 to 50. Um, so we're looking at injuries that they lived with for several decades. We're seeing the inner ear here. And this is a comparison, I believe, of the two sides. And this comparison is showing how one side is significantly damaged to the point that they're completely deaf in this side. Um, it is thought that this one is damaged and so that there is still some deafness, but not complete deafness in the left side, just complete deafness in the right side. And I've got some more. Oh, it was the same one. Is that or this? Okay. I also have this is a layout of part of his skeleton. Mm, let me do it this way. Hold on one second. Keyboard shortcuts are amazing balls. And you can see with this layout of his skeleton the different pieces within his skeleton, right, that they have found. This is a complete, almost complete skeleton. Um, with Shanadar 1, um, what we're seeing, again, is several decades of medical care. We're seeing somebody that needed medical chair, care as a child, and we're seeing somebody that needed medical care throughout their life. Like, this is an injury that happened when they were young, so it's not like they were ever somebody who was out hunting. Right. It's not like they were ever somebody who was out being a uh, heavily what we might think of as productive member of society. Right. I think that there are a lot of different ways to produce within society. We've discussed that several times. There's something weird on my phone. Um, but being very heavily productive, as in like your heavy lifter, right, your laborer. Um, so. With that, what we're seeing with Shannon Darwin is extensive care, not only medical care, but continued care afterwards. I've gone over a couple of things, and we're going to go more into medicine, but I do want to open up for questions on the first things that we talked about, and a little bit about this as we start. So I'm going to open up for probably 10, 15 minutes, and then I'll close up. And what I'll do is I'll put it on subscribers only so I can read back through your questions. Um, so make sure and put them in if you want them. Um, I appreciate if you put my an at at me so I can know that you're asking me a question and not talking to somebody else who was commenting. Um, again, I will turn these back off. Comments are not fun for anybody. Um, nobody's quite sure why my chats engender such hate, but they seem to. <laughs> uh, so thank you. I got fun to, this morning. Um, so we do keep the comments off for the most part because for many people it makes it a lot easier to to hear or to be a part right you know you think the talking makes it easier but um for many people in here uh it gets wild hey guys that's why i stay on youtube also we are over on youtube um, though it is not the same channel right now. Um, so it's kind of, if you know it, you got it. I can't, I don't even have a link up for it because, um, it is being changed. I think it's little me right now is the name of it or Adawitta. 
Um, so it's at a widow, um, but uh, I am changing it over. So if you watch there, please don't subscribe there. Please go and uh, subscribe to the other channel. So I do have a website up now that uh, has links to most of the stuff that we talk about. Um, I also have stuff on YouTube. Um, I do some political stuff through written word. Um, so there is a book on Amazon currently. I'm working on ways to publish that on a free platform because Amazon won't let me sell it for free. They make me sell it. Um, so uh, I have that as well. Um, those are pretty much the platforms I'm on. I'm not really a very big social media person for my own sanity. Um, so. Uh, so there's only like there's a saw like there's a paperback on there. Pretty if you purchase the uh, paperback, um, I will give you my address and you can send it to me and I will sign it and probably send it back with something else. Um, if you want if you want to sign copy, that would be wonderful. I'm totally down for that. Um, uh, but if you if you want to do that, if you want to purchase a signed copy and or purchase a copy, if you send it to me. Just you have ways to get a hold of me. We've talked. Uh, just uh, I'll send you my address and you can just send it to me and I'll just send it back to you. The name of the YouTube channel that we you should subscribe to is just like my TikTok n.witta.org, but it has a dot 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 at the end. Um, and it is linked on the nwittaor.com. It is at the very top of the nwittaor.com website. Um, so that you can link to the new channel to the inwittaora.com. Um, and, uh, and again, um, I have to have a certain number of people to go live from the YouTube. And so until then, I'll be going live from the old YouTube. Um, but I have applied for it. So once I hit that number, it should be allowable. I do. I do. Um, so I do have it up for sale. I just need to get it... Um, so I have to figure out how to make what they call an EPUB file and what programs I need to do an EPUB file that aren't Adobe because I don't want to pay for Adobe. Adobe makes you pay like $15 a month to use Adobe and that fucks with me. Um, so uh, I'm trying to find a different way to make an EPUB file. Once I get an EPUB file, then I can do a free publication um, from a bunch of free sites, but they all require an EPUB file for the publication. Um, once I do that, then I can publish to free sites and then it can be distributed freely. Okay, I will. I'll go ahead and grab a P.O. box. Um, I won't worry about a Prudy. I've already talked to Prudy quite a few times, but for the future, I will absolutely go and grab a P.O. box if I'm going to do that with anybody else, just because you're correct. And that's why I'm trying to change everything over. Um, the amount of hate I've engendered, um, I've only been here six months, right? Like I've only been doing this six months. And I don't think, uh, I think I'm finally again off of account warning. Um, and, and I might have stayed off for two days now. Um, <laughs> So, oh, that's a good idea, Alan Sam. I bought actually, yeah, that's a good idea. Thank you. I'll go and see. They can probably do that. I can take it over there. I've got it all. I just, and I have a, a, a stick so I can take it over there. That's a great idea. I'll do that. That's a great way to do it. Um, awesome. Awesome. Thank you, Prudy. Oh, you guys are amazing balls. Thank you so much. Little, is it still taking you to little old me? Shit. Hold on a second. No, it's not correct. Um, let me fix it. Really quick. And that's why people have been subscribing to that. Okay. Because I noticed that they've gone up and I'm like, uh. I don't think we need a mod right now, uh, Subtle. I think we're doing okay on it right now. Um, oh. Oh, that's Discord. That's why. Okay, that's why. Um, I... That's weird. Um, so I think epigenetics absolutely to me shows me that, um, 
violence is going to carry down through, um, it's going to be a hard cycle to break, right? Um, so I absolutely think that we see that epigenetics would absolutely give violence in the DNA and in the, in the, in the structure of us, right? Um, that being one of those things where we have to figure out how to break the cycle of it, right? Um, but I think that that's why it becomes a cycle. Can you try it again, Ducray? I just, I think I might've fixed it. If you can try it and see, there's only one video up on that channel right now. And it says uh, who I am or who am I? No, who I am. Um, but I definitely think that we see that violence and trauma definitely carries through epigenetics. Um, because I think that we all like to think, or many people like to think that violence is natural to the human state. Um, and I would agree that when you look at violence as um, like killing an animal for food is violent. Um, I don't view killing an animal for food as violent because I can view that as, um, I view violence as harm for no reason, right? Or harm for, um, harm for reasons other than basic, right? Like uh, food is a necess necessity, right? That's that cycle of life that we're all a part of, right? So um, being a part of that cycle um, to me isn't violent or partaking in that cycle isn't violent. An animal killing me isn't violence, right? Me killing an animal isn't violence. Um, but um, action that harms something that isn't to meet my basic needs is violence to me. Um, and so I don't think I look at violence as part of the cycle. I don't think violence is benign, though. So I think that people think of violence as benign, but violence's results aren't benign. And um, I think that yeah, see, I think that there's a difference between so me killing a person isn't cruel, it is violent, right? Um, but me and me killing an animal isn't cruel, um, but the effect to the body is violent um, or harmful. Uh, so I don't know, I'll have to look into it a little bit more and see. But to me, I just don't view it the same. Like to me, I don't view that as violent, right? So I don't think that we are violent innately, right? I don't think that hunting is innately violent and therefore I don't think that we're innately violent. Um, when we're looking at that, it means that violence being something that's not innate to our system is extremely impactful to our system, right? Anything that's outside and not innate to who we are that is um, forced upon us is extremely impactful, right? It, it, it causes a level of uh, change to the system, right? Same thing in like a biome. Anything that's not natural to that biome that's forced upon that biome causes a changes to that biome. The body is a biome. It's, you know, so. Um, <laughs> okay, cool. Um, so I don't think that we are naturally violent. I think that we are naturally capable of, you know, feeding ourselves. Um, okay. So, and I do believe in things like the warrior gene and stuff like that, but I do know that those things are things that come later. And the reason we know that those things are things that come later is because, um, well, A, we've identified that those things come from an aggressive personality gene um, that we've identified where that comes from, right? That really goes back to that narcissistic personality disorder stuff. Because usually with the warrior gene, um, if it flips, um, that's that aggressive gene. And if it flips, it goes into those aggressive mental disorders, right? Um, so in my understanding of it. And again, I'm not a genes person. I understand what has been told to me and explained to me. And I understand it for now. And I understand it can change, right? Yes. If you abuse any animal, they can be more likely to be destructive than necessarily, right? Um, so I can't, it's not a PDF. 
I have to use Adobe not to create a PDF file, but to create what's called an ePublications file. And it's ePub, E-P-U-B. Um, and you use Adobe and save as, and it will save as an ePub file. But I can't do that from Microsoft Word. There is a program that you can do it on Microsoft Word, but it's glitchy is what they've said. And it's been my experience. It's problematic. So it doesn't save it right. Um, and it doesn't upload to be opened right. Uh, so I have to get into an Adobe program and upload a Word document into an Adobe. And I, I mean, I've already got it saved as a PDF. I tried to upload it as a PDF. It wouldn't work that way. Um, I have to go into a PDF and then switch it to an EPUB. But the idea would be good. Or the, 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 the library idea is a great idea. Um, so when we see that um, violent gene thing coming through, what we're seeing is that it comes through later. And it really comes through with the fact that violence is happening, right? Um, abuse is happening. Um, and so it's not necessarily something that's created to, um, it's created to defend us. So this newer behavior comes in and now we have to find a way to protect ourselves from this newer behavior, right? Before we're afraid of the mountain lion, now we're afraid of human, right? Before we're afraid of the mountain lion and all the mountain lion wants to do is get dinner. Now we're afraid of human who not only wants to get dinner, but they want to destroy our entire family line to get that dinner, okay? So now I have to defend my home, right? Um, or I end up being a, uh, a um, what's the word I'm looking for? Or I end up being a soldier for somebody else. And so I start breeding that aggressive gene into my children because being a soldier for somebody else pays, right? So it's more of a mutation, right? But we're going to get into that part too when it comes to food. Um, because that's not really, what, well, we're omnivores, yes. Um, but we can see where different groups are more herbivore and more carnivore, especially with the Neanderthals. So I can try that too. But let's go ahead and get into the rest of medicine of um, Neanderthals and then food within Neanderthals. So we're going to go into La Chapelle next. And I'm going to go ahead and turn off comments so that my brain focuses again. Um, we're going to go into La Chapelle next. La Chapelle um, has a lot of interesting morphology, just like um, we see with Shanadar 1. And the interesting mo morphology that we see with La Chapelle really um, becomes this understanding of, no, that's not the right thing. See what I do, see what I do. Um, we get this understanding of how this interaction of medicine is absolutely playing into um, the survival rate of this species, right? Um, if we're looking at a very genetically small species, and again, we're also looking at a, a species that um, uh, never made it over 500,000 for its entire species whole, right? So we're looking at a species who is always going to be small. Um, and if they're always going to be small, what you're really looking at is the need of every member of that species to be a part of the community, right? If you only have a few anyways, you got to make sure that um, you're, you're continuing as a species, which means that everybody has value to continue your species. Again, Neanderthals have four life stages. They're the closest to us in life stages, uh, which means that they have extended childhoods. And those extended childhoods, are uh, they require help, right? They require somebody nurturing, nothing else watching the child while other people are going out. And it requires several people to hunt and several people to gather so that you're staying safe in a space where you've got predators right? Um, people staying home to 10. So when you're doing that in a genetically small community or in diverse bands and groups of different species, you need everybody in your community. Every member of your community is a valued and important member of community. And when every member of your community is a valued and important member of community, you medic the ones that, that are injured. You heal the ones that are injured. 
Well, we know with um, La Chapelle, um, first of all, again, uh, this recreation behind me is La Chapelle. Um, and the old one to that side of me is the one where it was used very much for racism in the early part of our um, understanding of paleoanthropology. Um, that's not what I wanted. It's not telling me what I want it to. Um, but when we're looking at this, we're getting this understanding that I'm sorry, my thing is not giving me the thing that I want completely here. And I'm trying to get more than a date for you. Uh, and I have a lot of um, like PDFs on my computer, but I don't want it. They're hard to like search through. I've got to find. Okay, so. What we're looking with him is that he has uh, lost most of his teeth, uh, bone reabsorption in the mandible, which means that after the loss of the teeth, the bones are kind of reabsorbing. Um, they're changing within the mandible, um, which it degenerates and causes pain. Um, and then uh, we're seeing that he has severe osteoarthritis. Um, and one of his limbs has, and I know it says it somewhere, but it's not in that article. And I don't want to, again, mix two people up. Um, And well, they'll talk about the results of the morphology and how it was used, which is good. They're not uh, talking about all of the morphology. Okay, so here we go. Um, they He's lost most of his cheek teeth, degeneration of the jaw, uh, inflammation to the ear canals, in, in, inclinating, he, indicating hearing loss, osteoarthritis in his shoulder, uh, osteoarthritic degeneration of the neck, a damaged he, hip joint and a healed rib fracture. Okay, I guess not. Um, I must have complied with the two. And I was looking over them this morning and this is how my brain works sometimes, unfortunately. Um, but what we're seeing still is somebody who has lived like this um, for an extended period of time. And as they've um, started to hit a advanced age, these narrative diseases are taking over their body. They're still being cared for within their family. This skull is really interesting to me. And the reason that this skull is really interesting to me is because the weird morphology on the skull, which I think has to be post because of the ways it is, but you're seeing what I'm talking about here. Let me make this larger again. This, right? This huge chunk out of the front of the middle of the skull. But if you look at this, this, um, so what's inside of it is again that putty, this putty that we're seeing here. And really they use that putty to just kind of hold the bones together where there's an absence of bone, right? They mold it around the putty so that it can keep it together. Um, so what you're seeing at the base of that is that putty. Um, to my understanding, no. Is it? Yes. So I would believe so because it looks like it po could possibly be um, the bone itself. Either or, this is chipped out post. And the reason that I can tell you that this is chipped out post death, right? Or at time of death. So um, either at, which is Perry or post mortem. Um, and this is because there's no remodeling of the bone around this hole. We don't see that there's any um, growth. We've talked about this a little bit before, how we can tell with um, like 
the 31,000 year old surgery, how we can tell uh, how old she was at death and how long ago the surgery was, you can see that there's no like, what it does is it kind of creates this lip over the edge of a wound. And there's none of that here. And it kind of softens the edge of the wound and it's not really here. So what we're seeing with this is there's this very interesting morphology on the skull, but it all seems, or at least the vast majority of it seems to be post or at time of death. Um, again, what we're looking at, some of these holes, actually this hole right above the, um, you can see here, this one here kind of shows a little bit of regrowth. Can you see what I'm talking about where you see this kind of slip here and then you see this interior here and it's kind of soft? So it is possible that this could be prior injuries that's regrown. Um, I haven't seen a study on it that really goes into that though. Um, and looking at this as well, um, it's absolutely within the burial. So this is a recreation of what the burial looked like based on, I believe, photographic evidence. La Chapelle is 1909, so you're getting early photographs in 1900s. And this is uh, what the burial itself, um, or not the burial itself, but what the find itself looked like as they were uncovering it and documenting it. How he was situated in the grave itself. You can see actually that his spine is over here. Weirdly, right? No, that's not him. That's a that's something else. That's not human. I'll have to go and look and see what he was buried with. The reason I can tell that this isn't human is look down here. So first, what caught me was, as you look, Here's his ribs, right? And here's his hand and there's his spine through the base of his ribs, right? I'm like, that doesn't make sense. Why is it here and here? This is absolutely a spine. You can see the verte vertebra here. But you see down here where it's this long uh, kind of uh, leaf shaped uh, protuberance out of the side of the spine, right? Um, my brain escapes me this morning, so I can't give you the exact verbiage of what those are called. And I know it, but I just can't do it right now. Um, in Homo sapiens or uh, humans, that's not that big. We have that. Um, let me see if I can find a human spine image to help show that a little bit better. Um, but we don't have the uh, extended leaf that that spine has. And so that spine. Um, I think those are spinal processes, but I can't, uh, can't grasp it. But I'm going to pull up this picture of a spine. And you can see with the human spine that it does have, and this is what your ribs are, uh, well, no, not quite. Your ribs are attaching to some of them. So in the T-spine, in the T-spine, you'll see these little sockets here on them that your uh, posterior, your back ribs attached to. Um, but uh, the ones down on the bottom don't attach ribs. There's no ribs down there. Uh, but you'll see that they're smaller on a human or a homo species. Um, whereas in that picture, you can see that those processes are very long, do you see? And you can even see where his are not quite as long, right? Where his ribs are attaching. So that is the burial itself. And apparently there was an animal found within the burial and I did not see that anywhere, um, which would be a cool thing to know. This is a really cool 
um, site I found is going to give us some 3D perspectives of La Chapelle himself. Oh, come on, do it backwards, do it backwards. As you can see up top, there's different images of the damage to his body or to his skull, to the morphology of his skull. So I wanted to give you guys some images with that just so that you could see what we're dealing with. But we're going to go ahead and talk a little bit more about what we see with medicine. So as evidence within these two finds, we see an amputation of a forearm for Kreb. Um, we see um, the uh, loss of the teeth and the need to be helped with the uh, with severe advanced arthritis and age, right, um, that we see with La Chapelle. La Chapelle is thought to have been roughly 40, I think. Um, we see with this medicine within the skeletal structure, but another thing that we see within the skeletal structure and how we're rating food as well is in the dentition. In the dentition on hominin teeth, um, or I think probably all dentition, there's that plaque development layer. We know this, we go to the dentist to get rid of it, right? In that plaque development layer, the food that you eat is retained, right? The DNA from the food particles that you eat is retained in that plaque layer. And one of the things that we see with Neanderthals is that there is an herbology within the plaque layers that we've detected that has nothing to do with flavor or calories. And so we see these as being medicinal. They are in fact plants that have medicinal qualities currently, are known for medicinal qualities. And a lot of times we'll see that the morphology with the skeleton tracks with the herbs that we find within the enamel or the plaque within the teeth. And so this tells us that not only are we looking at a physical healing of the skeleton, right? Um, a work on the body, an amputation with Kreb, right? Not only are we working on that, but we are also working with herbs. And as we've discussed before with the amputations, um, to prevent infection, you need to know what herbs you need to do to, pre to, to use to prevent infection, both to wash your tools in, um, wash your hands in, and to feed the person. Hello, beautiful. Good morning. Both to wash your, um, your tools in and also to, um, to feed the person, right? To uh, make a tea out of so that the person is absolutely, it could be a dog or was fine. You're right. Um, and so that the person is able to, um, to prevent and stave off infection in their body, right? Um, we, we are less likely to absolutely need um, anesthetic in a forearm amputation than in a lower limb amputation. Um, part of the shock with a lower limb amputation is the body's knowledge that it will not walk anymore. Um, and so uh, it's a significant change to the body's ability to homeostasis itself. It's a significant change to balance. It's a significant change to everything. And so the body will go in shock because of that knowledge. And that's part of the reason that with lower limb amputations, we believe that you absolutely have to um, have some form of anesthesia um, with what we've seen throughout our own records. Um, so you might not need it as much with a forearm amputation. But this is our oldest amputation. This is like, well, he's uh, 70,000 years ago is uh, Shanadar one. And uh, he lived after the amputation. So I don't think that we have tracked at what age that he had his forearm amputated because it was amputated the joint. So it's not like there's a slice through the bone, right? Um, and so we can't track remodeling in that bone. And it's also in a withered body part um, but it's going to have to happen sometime post the childhood injury. Um, you're going to figure that that's going to take a few years for things to wither away with that, right? Um, and so you're going to see that it's going to happen a few years post the childhood injury. So this, again, shows steady care of injury over extended period of time within a group or a band, right? Um, really showing 
just a high level of medicine that we really don't find again until much later in Homo sapiens, right? Um, Homo sapiens absolutely use these things for a long period of time, and then it is stamped out. And we thought that they weren't there um, until Western thought found them again, right? Um, and again, it's it's the fact that Western thought doesn't like to believe things unless uh, smack dab in the front of its face, right? Especially anything that uh, fucks with their worldview, right? Like points out the flaw in their white supremacy, you know? Uh, so we definitely see that medicine is within Neanderthal. Um, and we see that we can track food within Neanderthal in the same ways that we are able to track some of the medicinal properties. Let me go ahead, we're 9.17. I'm gonna go ahead and open it up for questions again for 10 minutes, and then I'm gonna pop it out and we're gonna go into uh, the different food evidences that we have now and what this is showing us within Neanderthal. Um. Unfortunately, I don't think we can be. Um... So we're designed. We're all designed to have to have animal protein. We can't have too much animal protein because too much animal pro protein um, will overdose us. Just like too much water will overdose us, right? We can overdose on anything. Um, but our bodies require animal protein. And today, when we don't use animal protein, we have to find replacement proteins. And we find that even with the replacement proteins, a lot of those replacement proteins um, still aren't quite giving enough, right? I have a lot of friends who are vegetarian. I have some friends who are vegetarian, not by choice, but because um, they're actually allergic to animal proteins. But... <laughs> their body's lack of receiving animal proteins is still very detrimental to their body. They're constantly sick and they will tell you, I'm constantly sick because I can't eat animal proteins, right? Um, because I can't give the nutrients to my body. My iron is always low, but you can get iron from other things. Like you can get better iron from farina and from spinach than you can from a red steak. As somebody, I mean, I get iron infusions every six weeks. That's how low my iron is. Like I have to go in and get it replaced. It has to do with Iraq. Um, but uh, we absolutely need iron. Absolutely. Um, but we also need some of these other fatty acids and proteins that come within animal proteins. And so we absolutely need some of these. Um, we do not need the amounts that we have today. We do not need the amounts that we have today. Nobody needs a large amount of anything, right? We are supersized life is not really good for us, right? Um, so, uh, you know, instead of having a six ounce steak every night, six ounces of meat in a week is probably enough animal protein to feed the nutrients of the body, right? Unless you're doing a lot of really heavy work. Yeah, we did not eat like they teach, right? We did not, we don't eat correctly, right? Um, and we can supplement some things, but again, we find that the supplements aren't as positive for the body. And look at like milk. Milk is still an animal protein, right? We're still getting an animal protein in. Um, it's an animal protein that we can get in without physically killing an animal. Absolutely, right? Um, but that's why we started with cheese anyways, right? That's why we start developing cheese is because it's an animal protein that we can make sustainably, right? So with that, um, we see that evidence also within Neanderthals and we see that evidence within early Homo sapiens. We've never been like, okay, so we know now within Neanderthals that certain Neanderthals ate were more carnivoric and certain animals were more um, herbivoric, but this was dependent on the locale that they were in. So what it was, was not that they were choosing to be more carnivoric or choosing to be more herbivoric, excuse me, but the locale necessitated them to be more carnivoric or more herbivoric. And in both spaces, we see the presence of the other. We just see that it is more carnivoric than herbivoric. 
or omnivore, right? So being able to uh, tolerate milk itself, the lactase, is the adaptation. Yes, absolutely. Um, we see that it first starts in West Africa and in uh, Middle Western Europe, like I think France. Um, and those are the two spaces that we see the first adaptations for lactase, the first uh, uh, breeding of milk quality. Um, we also see that when you cannot tolerate lactase in milk, often you can tolerate it in processed things like the, the processing of cheese, right? Which is how we start it. We don't start it by drinking milk so much. We start it by uh, making cheese out of the milk and butter out of the milk. And it's those things that our body starts absorbing and the start of absorbing those things develops the ability to tolerate lactose. Um, Yeah, and and that's the thing. So, but that's why it is an adaptation, right? Sleepy, right? Because an adaptation is something that's specific to a specific space, right? And it's adapted for that specific space. Um, it's not an advantage to the species because it's not something that works for everybody or works everywhere. Though, I mean, if it did become a species whole, then it would be an advantage. Um, whereas light skin would never be an advantage as a species whole, right? Um, but it is an adaptation based on um, based on us, right? So if our earliest record of any agriculture of uh, wheat and barley is, I'm finding roughly 15,000 years ago, we see some of our earliest um, tending of it along the Nile, which makes total sense considering the Nile. Um, and then we see that the... Um, we're getting barley and wheat as a big part of the culture at around 10,000 years ago. Um, and those are in a couple separate spaces too. One's in Africa and one's uh, just north of the Levant, if my memory serves correct. And then um, we're seeing that cheese and uh, domestication of animals comes after this, right? That it's after we domesticate to some extent wild grains that we start to domesticate animals. Yeah. And and, and that's a lot of it is that um, we can eat them, but our bodies let us know that they're not happy with us. Well, and the thing is, is that like, um, like if you're lactose intolerant, you can eat it and you're still going to get some of the benefits of it, but then your body is going to be slightly sick to get rid of everything else, right? It will take some of, so if you drink milk and you're lactose intolerant, uh, your body will accept the vitamin D in the milk, but, well, I think vitamin D is actually an additive, accept the iron in the milk, and then it will discharge through nasty processes, the things that it can't process like the lactase. So it will take what it can process and get rid of the rest of it violently. So your body is still processing some of it, it's just getting rid of everything it can't process. Well, and we find that most allergies develop after somebody has been repetitively exposed to large amounts of something like bee stings uh, or gluten. I really think that gluten is an allergy that's kind of being developed because we've been exposed to such large amounts of it and it's become such a predominant part of our diet. Um, and when it becomes the primary part of our diet, our body goes, bitch, give me some meat, right? Like, <laughs> why the fuck you not feed me the variety that my body needs? How about some leafy greens up in this house, right? Like, um, uh, so I really feel for me, um, and I don't know if the science backs this up completely, just the things that I've read. It seems to me that really the intolerance comes from the fact that it's so prevalent within our diets. Like so many things that you eat are based in wheat, right? I thought they were friends. <laughs> um, so when we're looking at Neanderthal diets, I find this really fascinating because we actually see the first evidence of cooked leftovers in Neanderthals. Again, this is Shanadar Cave, right? We have a lot of evidences coming out of Shanadar Cave right now. Um, we see the first evidence of cooked leftovers. Like, uh, so 
we have a flatbread that we have found within Shenandoah one or within Shenandoah Cape. And the flatbread that we have found has grains or grasses. When they're talking about grasses, frequently what they're talking about is early grains, right? Because uh, wheat is a grass initially, right? So it is barley, it's a grass initially. It's just the seed heads from the grass that we're able to eat, right? Um, these early grasses, the grains from early grasses, you have to soak them and pound them for them to be edible. And the Neanderthals understood enough of complex food production, they were able to do that, right? And um, we're seeing that not only are they doing things like cooking flatbread, but they're cooking flatbread that has pulses or lentils and grains are, you know, like uh, grasses or grains and um, a wide variety of other things within them. Um, so this is giving us a broader view of what their diet is when it comes to um, not only the different things that they're eating, but their knowledge of food production, right? Uh, a lot of things we find indigenous groups are able to make edible that you or I might not view as edible because they understand what needs to be processed for that food. Like in this case where you take these grains and you would soak them and then pound them to get these hard, tiny seeds to work for um, creating bread, right? Um, so I find for me uh, that to be a really important thing. I am kind of a foodie myself. I mean, currently I have food issues. Um, it's not that I don't love food, it's that my body is rejecting half of it. But um, I'm kind, I, I love different foods. And to find out that Neanderthals are eating flatbreads, I mean, flatbread really is a global phenomenon. It has gone across every group of people across the globe has had some form of a flatbread across history. Um, it's really our earliest uses of grains, really, um, because if you think about it, um, you have to understand yeast to raise bread, right? To get out of that flatbread kind of thing, right? Um, and also when you don't have an oven, it's much easier to create a flatbread and cook it on a hard, hot stone than it is to try and and make a, uh, you know, a loaf in a pan, right? Like, or, or even like shape a loaf and like heat it in an oven that doesn't exist, right? So flatbread is pretty global and we see it within the Neanderthals. The other things that we see within the Neanderthals um, is just a wide variety of, of utilizing the land itself, right? So this is why we see that some Neanderthals might be more carnivorous, whereas some Neanderthals more might be more, um, herbivoric. Sorry, sometimes again, my word's slipping. And so with that, what we're seeing is that dependent on the space you are in is dependent on the food that you're eating. Now I've talked about this before. This is really healthy, right? This is being healthy. When you are part of an indigenous biome, you eat what's in that indigenous biome. You're indigenous to that biome. Um, the biome provides everything you need. The biome provides everything you, you, you everything your body needs to meet life, right? Um, and that's part of evolution, right? That's part of evolving to suit a space, right? We evolved to perform different parts of this biome, right? Like we evolved to be the tenders in this indigenous biome. Um, and because of that, we're seeing that our part within the biome um, helps tend the land within the biome, but that land and that nature within the biome, we being a part of it provides everything we need. Just like that biome provides everything a plant needs, or just like that biome provides everything a, an animal needs, right? A fox lives in a biome that provides everything the fox needs, right? And so you're seeing that dependent on the biome that you're in is dependent on what your diet is. You're eating fresh and local, which makes sense, right? Um, and we're seeing that things like that actually create a healthy body, right? As opposed to eating things that are not indigenous to your biome or mass mononutrienting, right? Um, yeah, Mother Earth gives us abundance, like grand abundance. We just have to stop hoarding it. <laughs> the reason we don't feel like she gives us abundance is because a few people are hoarding the abundance that she gives, right? Um, and so if we can figure out how to stop that hoarding of that abundance, um, we absolutely have a vast amount of abundance. And the Neanderthals found that as well. 
uh, we find that the evidence of uh, the carnivorous group is in Western Europe. And that is the only group that we find that is carnivorous primarily. And I think that we find one group, I want to say like the Altai Mountains or something, but I can't geographically place that. So I'm not sure. Um, that is herbivoric mainly, but that all other groups are very omnivoric. They eat both, right? And that with all of these groups, we're seeing um, cooking technologies that we don't usually apply until later, like the soaking and pounding of grains, um, making things that you and I might not think today is edible, but that indigenous cultures have known to be edible for generations and that the Neanderthals themselves knew to be edible. Um, into edible things. And the variety is always going to be dependent on the biome. So it's going to fluctuate. So I cannot give you like specifics other than we know that they're eating grains, seeds, or not seeds, well, seeds, grains, um, plants, or not plants, grasses, which are seeds and grains, um, legumes, which are like lentils, um, some beans, I think. Um, and um, different fruits and vegetables. We found tubers, we found fish, we found a variety of different uh, meats, like uh, bones from different meats, like um, bear and cat, mammoth. Um, I don't think really that there's any type of meat in any, in any biome at that time that we're not finding in graves, or not graves. Oh, thank you, Harris. Um, and uh, we're finding that this variety um, is absolutely substantive to the diet, like it's absolutely needed within the diet. I'm not thinking that there's a lot of other um, like minute evidence on it. Um, and I'm trying to think if I'm missing anything on it. Again, I have some of these things up on the website. I have all the pictures linked up on the website. Um, some of the medicine stuff I have are PDFs from when I did research on it. So I don't actually have the medicine stuff up fully on the site, but I do have the new findings out of Shanadar Cave about food on the site. Um, and I will put up a couple more that I know of, like the carnivorous and the herbivore one. I just have to find them again. They're in my, they're in my um, saves. I just have to dig them. Uh, but the one that I do have up there is this recent one out of Shanadar, and it really goes into the complexity of food creation that we see within Neanderthal, which for me is important. I'm trying to have a great one, Ellen. Um, trying to think if I'm missing anything. I want to make sure I'm not missing anything. Though, again, you know, this is not meant to be <laughs> full information. I, you know, um, even even if I thought of myself as having all of the information, the information changes so fast right now, right? Like, and not that I am one of those people who kind of think of myself as the all or nothing, right? Like I don't have it all anyways, but even if I thought I had it all, it's changing so fast right now that it would be impossible to not um, have different information tomorrow. And I'll probably have different information the next time we go live. We'll probably keep the some of this, but we'll probably have some more stuff just because I'll probably be trying to transfer and find stuff. And as I do, I'll pull it up. Um, but we do see within these things really that start of a foodie culture and really that start of um, understanding is understanding of food as more than just nutrition, right? <laughs> I love the connections that get made when I have comments on. It's the one reason like I like comments being on is because I can see people giving each other information and education, right? Um, I personally know about the honey. That's a huge one to me, uh, but I don't often think about 
telling everybody. So having other people who know this beautiful information be able to impart that beautiful information, that's actually an extremely important one, right? Um, is amazing. And I love the conversations. I love the conversations that we see. That just, oh, pretty. Uh, is he home? Okay. Okay. I just had to make sure. I know how the state works and I know how horrific it can be within our um, communities and how it really just doesn't give a flying fuck. Um, so we'll just have to work to change it, you know, just have to have to fix this shit, right? And your child's 19. Why? Yeah. The government, you know, comes up with a thousand different reasons why none of those reasons why or anything else. Oh, yeah. I mean, I'm still like surprised CPS is showing up for somebody who's 19, but somebody probably told them that they were younger, right? Um, and so, yeah, yeah. And anything that's a speak out. Has anybody watched Alaskan Daily? And if you have, have you noticed that Alaska Daily is no longer, it got six episodes in and it wasn't the final of the season. It was obviously not the final of the season, but they've shut it down. Jesus. I'm so sorry, Prudy. Is this something where, um, if you're still in the middle of this, is this something where we can reach out to local areas and speak out for you and help advocate for you? If, if so, um, if you want to let us know the area, we can figure out ways to get a hold of spaces, the government spaces within the area in call and and I'm assuming that that is uh, the uh, the name that they would know, right? Um, so if we're uh, calling, we know who to advocate for. Okay. Um, I'll get some information out on that. Uh, yeah, MMIW application causes a lot of trauma and a lot of pain, I know. Um, just because, I mean, not just within the state, but just because of the fact that, uh, I mean, understanding what's going on is very traumatic, right? And, and, and the losses that we're going through is very traumatic, right? Arizona. Sorry, Arizona. Um, have a great one, sleepy. Enjoy your day, love. Um, yeah, it, it's it's very problematic. And 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 like I said, like even with Alaskan Daily, and Alaskan Daily was getting watched. I'm pretty sure they took it down because it was just a little too impactful, right? Hillary Swank is a mainstream actress, and to have a mainstream actress. Uh, showing a show that really speaks out against an MMIW crisis and is really kind of bringing to light the MMIW crisis on a mainstream app is absolutely astounding that they let it happen in the first place. Um, and I'm not surprised that they shut it down after six episodes. I'm really upset because I was really enjoying it, right? I was really enjoying the information getting out there. And um, I really loved the fact that it was very much 
why the fuck do we need some white girl to come in here and deal with this? Why can't I deal with this? And um, kind of showing just how problematic it is when you have somebody from outside coming in, right? Um, and showing the necessity and the necessary um, self-awareness actions that one must take if one is in that position, right? Um, showing Hillary become aware of what's actually going on, right? Okay. And are you sharing that on your um, your site, Prudy? Welcome, Tori. Thank you so much. Um, on my website, actually, there's a link to a Discord channel that we use as well um, and uh, access to different uh, things as well. Okay. Okay, I'll go and look at your um, your feed after this so I can get more information, Prudy and share some of it. I'll get some of it out there, duet some of it um, so that we can get some of it more out. Awesome, you're already over, Tori. Um, Prudy is going through some um, drama that uh, is happening themselves with the state being shits because that's the state. Um, they're going to share some more information on um, their webs or on their TikTok feed so that you can find some details on it but they're dealing out of Cochise County and they could absolutely use some avocation. Um, so if you have the, the avocation spoons, if you want to take a look at their um, feed uh, after they can get some stuff up and, and try and help advocate for them, that would be helpful for them. Um, but yeah, I think that that's one of those things that we just really have to work on, right? That awareness aspect of it and um, the awareness that, advocating that awareness has causing issues for people, right? Um, first, many people just don't realize um, what's going on. And for many people, we see that I want to make sure that I have it all documented. Sorry. Oh, uh, for many people, we see that um, that lack of awareness of what's going on with uh, I love Trevor Noah. I love a lot of these uh, uh, mainstream or uh, more famous people that are bringing light to issues. There's a lot of issues within the United States that really need to be brought to light within the treatment of the black community within the United States. And I always feel that we need to do more of that. Uh, I also feel that we talk a lot about those issues and not a lot about the issues that are happening within the indigenous community within the United States. We like to think that the indigenous communities within the United States don't exist. We, we have decided that we killed them off and so they don't exist anymore. So we don't talk about them. We don't discuss them mainstream. And I always wanted to be able to tell Trevor, you need to get LaDonna Brave Bull in here. You need to get um, some of these other activists that we have that are indigenous activists so that they can start speaking on the indigenous uh, you know, movement and the indigenous in issues here within the United States. Um, and of course, LaDonna has since passed because of uh, the tumors in her brain due to Standing Rock. Um, but I feel like we can uplift both issues within the United States. And I feel like we need to, right? I feel like um, uplifting the indigenous issue doesn't detract from the issues that we're, indigenous issue makes it sound like it's um, the indigenous people. So let me rephrase that. Up, uplifting the issues that indigenous people have with the state um, doesn't detract with up from uplifting um, the issues that black people within the United States have with the state. Um, and if we can find a way to make sure that both are being made aware on an equal basis, um, it, it would be great. I haven't seen Lizzo's acceptance speech. I don't watch award shows usually. I'll have to look that up. I love Lizzo. And I'm not like a modern music person. Like I don't do a lot of modern music, but I'm like, oh, I love you. <laughs> You're so gorgeous. <laughs> Can I have some more of you? Um, uh, so I'll have to take a look that, at that though. But uh, that's for me is, is one of the things that I have a real, um, 
sadness about, right? I don't ever want it to detract from the fact that the state is still very much harming black people, right? Like I don't ever want it to detract from that, but I want it to, I want to um, see more awareness, right? And so it was really beautiful to see Alaskan Daily and I'm really disappointed that they pulled it off. I would not want to after that either, Prudy. I mean, that would really piss me off. I would not want to. Um, I think within that though, that what we really need to uplift is that the state is not treating any of these groups appropriately, you know? Well, yeah, out of the safety zone, I, I totally, I totally don't blame him, right? I mean, I mean, I don't have to tell you, uh, cause I know, you know, and so I'm not saying this to you directly, but I mean, with the history of what we've gone through with our residential schools and shit like that, right? Like I, if I was him, I wouldn't want to leave it either, right? The, the, the degradation, uh, the uh, racism, the, uh, you know, all of it, right? I wouldn't want to either. Then there's also, you know, like when they were moving everybody off the reses into cities and disconnecting everybody, right? To try and mainstream everybody, right? So for all of it, I can see where the safety within community becomes paramount, especially for our younger generations who are really the first generations who are getting a chance to um, to possibly be without the residential schools. I do know of a couple of residential schools that are still active, right? Um, a couple that are taken over by the indigenous nation that they were around and so they're run by the indigenous nation now. And a couple who are still open um, with more indigenous peoples running them, but still uh, church-based, right? Um, one here in Oregon that's still church-based and ran by indigenous peoples, and then one in Eastern Washington that is completely ran by indigenous, the indigenous group, right? Oh, that's awesome. Um, but this being the first generation, because most people don't understand that residential schools didn't really stop until the 90s, which Gen X really, you know, <laughs> millennials, like, uh, you know, really had to deal with that. And so Zoomers really being the first generation or the later half of millennials being the first generations that don't have to deal with residential schools on that level, I can absolutely see, you know, desiring to not be a part of the indoctrination system, right? Yeah. Well, and it just is, it's everywhere. It, it runs throughout our structures and our systems to the bottom level. Racism is is horrific within our system. The United States is really um, unique. Well, I think that Canada probably has the same uniqueness in the fact that we were really built on that racist ideology, right? Racism starts with the, the Europeans landing in Turtle Island, and then racism is this, the, the uh, justification for what the Europeans are doing here in Turtle Island. And so our countries are so founded in that systemic racism, like it really just in the first words, right? And so, uh, yeah, and these two pictures, right? Like, oh, this guy is what this person looks like. This guy is what everybody decided he looked like, you know, to double down on that racism. And so our country really, um, well, the United States really has so much structural racism that I often think that really it just... Uh, just requires it to just kind of, you can't fix what's not broken. You just got to reset it. Right. Um, but you know, I think that a lot of the start is knowledge, right. Getting out knowledge. I don't think people, I don't think people still, I don't think people understand that certain things are happening. Right. I think that we're so blind sometimes, so willfully ignorant sometimes that, um, people just aren't aware. Thank you. I'm grateful. Um, community was a hard thing for me my whole life, right? Like I had community really early and then we moved. And when I came back to the res, I didn't come back to my res or, you know, the, the, the reservation that I've been on younger. And so like, it was a totally different ball game. 
Um, and certain groups in the Pacific Northwest uh, tend to look like me and certain groups in the Pacific Northwest don't tend to look like me. Um, and so I didn't find a lot of community until later in life. And I still struggle with community, but I think that that has to do with the ADD. Um, and so for me, being welcomed and loved and encouraged to speak out is something that gives me a huge level of gratitude because um, all I've ever wanted to be is healing for community, right? Um, I mean, I've, I've had desires and dreams, but like the base is always, you know, part of community and um, ensuring that community is what it should be, right? Healthy, right? Um, and so thank you. I appreciate that. That for me is extremely um, welcome. Um, and I'm very grateful for that. Yes, I come from Skagit Valley, Tori. So you know exactly what I'm talking about, right? I grew up uh, all over Northwest, uh, the Pacific Northwest, Oregon and Washington, but I was born in the islands. I was born in Anacortes. And so, um, and my children are all up in Skagit. Well, half of my children are in Skagit. Um, but yeah, so you, you know exactly what I'm talking about. The communities within the Pacific Northwest, it can really fluctuate what community looks like within the Pacific, North, Pacific Northwest. Um, that's awesome, Prudy. And that's what we need, right? We need so many more of us who are able to speak out, right? So many more of us that are visible, right? So many more of us who are visible. I try to not be too invisible as an Indigenous person just because uh, I want the visibility for Indigenous people to be people who look more indigenous because I don't want me to be a comfort zone for people, right? I don't want my skin color to be comfort to your racism. I would rather that the people at the forefront aren't a comfort to your racism, right? That They point out the flaw within it, right? Um, just because for me, otherwise, uh, centering it on myself or putting myself at a forefront or things like that um, would be really harmful to the community as a whole, right? It's it's not making, uh, it's not making in indigenous acceptable to the white people, it's making white indigenous acceptable to the white people, right? Like, <laughs> it's, it's not making the community accepted. It's making people who look like me acceptable, right? And so, um, but I, I, for me, I don't think that skin color has shit all to do with indigeneity or um, how we indigenate. Um, I just want to make sure that I'm just very intentful in the things and the way I do it, right? I know what Longview is too. Oh, Great Island is gorgeous. As I love the I love the San Juans, um, which have to have a better name somewhere. But the Pacific Northwest is actually gorgeous. Oh, studies are now proving that uh, Siberians get their uh, half of their DNA from a migration from Turtle Island back. Um, we've talked in here before about the fact that the X gene is X1 in Turtle Island and X2 in the Siberian, er Siberian area, right? Um, this is a study that um, they're looking at that gives weight to that thought process that if X1 starts here, then the X mitochondrial DNA starting in Turtle Island and then taking it back to Siberia as the X2 DNA. Um, they are using the Bering Strait as the crossing. I'm going to double down on my thought process that if you're an Arctic people, you're crossing the actual Arctic. You don't need the Bering Strait to do it, <laughs> especially if you're a boat people. And we do see that there are many evidences of boat people, especially within the Thule culture at 8,000 years ago, 7,000 years ago in the Arctic here. Um, and so if you look at the globe from the top, you see that it is island hopping across the Arctic um, to get to uh, Siberia from North America, um, from like the Greenland area or from uh, even the Alaskan area, right? Um, it is definitely an island hopping journey. And so this actually shows that there is way more of a likelihood of that DNA starting here and then translating back to North America, or to uh, Europe. 
I believe that. I had to sign documents stating that they couldn't spank my child in school in, in the South in the in the early 2000s, right? 2004. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and you know, they don't like that. They really don't. I don't think that's why I ever really worked well within uh, mainstream school either, because I was doing that in the in kindergarten. Like I stood up in kindergarten and was like, uh, Columbus was a murderer. You can take him back now. Thank you. Um, but yeah, you definitely see a lot of that. Oh, I can imagine that that was not the, but you know, the, uh, the knowledge there too, right? Uh, yeah, I can see that. Okay, everybody, I am going to take off. I'm trying to keep these just down to two hours so that I maintain spoons. Um, I am, again, I'm working on a bunch of stuff. I'm trying to only do so much, though, so that I'm not overdoing myself and become annoyed or bored, right, or overwhelmed. Um, so I am doing some stuff. All of this stuff that we talked about today is on the website. I am still working on translating other things over. Um, so not everything is over there, but all the stuff we discussed today is. Um, and, uh, the YouTube on the website should take you to the new channel. Um, and again, if you want to keep the old channel for now, that's fine until the new channel gets above 50, I can't go live on it. So we'll still go live on the old YouTube channel for now. Um, and, uh, I'm trying to think if there's anything else I need to add to this. I do not think so. Thank you all. I'm going to read that out loud because I truly hope. Um, may we all walk in balance and beauty. So grateful for all. Thank you so much, Prudy. And I, I, I want to leave it with that. May we all walk in balance and beauty and, and be a healing for our community so that we can move forward. Have a blessed day. And I will see you guys. This is Friday morning. I will not see you guys again until Sunday night at um, 10 p.m. I will put that up so everybody knows that it's coming. Um, and again, it will be both on YouTube and on here. And we should have more stuff up on the website by then as well. So have a great one, everybody. Have a great afternoon, evening, and may your weekend be joyful. And Prudy, I will be going through your site later to make sure that we can get some more of that information out. Um, so thank you so much. And so we can get that, that out on a broader scale too. And I will be making some in research and some calls. Have a great one, everybody. Have a great one, everybody. Much love. That's not what I wanted to do. I do not want to. My websites are not working very well today. <laughs>